Hello, I was recently working on a problem and I thought, ooh, this will make a good coding quickie video. So here we are, a video about periodic numbers. That is, numbers that exist only within a range. These don't pop up very often, but when they do, they can be a bit head scratching to work with. So this video is about creating some C++ templates to help us work with such numbers. And a good example of these numbers might be something like angular degrees. To visualize this, a quick demonstration. Now this is a circle, and if you didn't know that, this video is probably already too advanced for you. And what we know about circles that we learn at school is that they consist of 360 degrees. So let's take a starting point up here and we'll call that zero degrees. We know that we have 90 degrees around here, 180 degrees down here, 270 degrees over to the left, and back at the top, we also have 360 degrees. We've been immediately presented with a problem that computers and algorithms don't particularly like. We have an equality between two values, zero is equal to 360. And there's a nice linear relationship here because if we say that one is also equal to 361, we can assert that 450 is equal to 90. The salient piece of information being that we can only have a number on our circle within the range greater than or equal to zero, but less than 360. Now I'm talking about angles because they're readily understood and easy to visualize, but we could be talking about other things which have this wraparound property, uh, things like spectrums of color. But sticking with angles, if I have 300 degrees and I add to that 90 degrees, what is the result? Well, obviously, by all accounts, it's 390 degrees, but that doesn't exist anywhere within our circular number range. If we went round to 300 degrees and then added 90 degrees to it, we can see on our original circle, we're somewhere about 30 degrees. Pretty obvious stuff. So what exactly is the problem? Well, let's assume I have something at, say, 20 degrees here, and I have something else at 340 degrees. How far apart are these two things in degrees? Well, if just left to my own devices, one way I could calculate it is 340 minus 20, which is obviously 320 degrees, and that's the answer this way around. If I look at it the other way and do 20 degrees minus 340, I end up with minus 320 degrees. Well, that's a bit strange because if I did minus 320 degrees starting off at 20, I end up somewhere around here on my wrappable circle. This isn't correct. In fact, that would take me to 40 degrees. However we want to look at it, the one thing that we've not looked at is this distance here. And that's simply because the very basic mathematical operators that we're using don't allow for this discontinuity of zero being 360. And if I ask the question, what's the quickest way to get from 20 degrees to 340 degrees, the only answer this system can deliver is the long way round. Instinctively, we might want to put in some sort of check that if 340 degrees minus 20 degrees is greater than or equal to 180 degrees, for example, we've gone around here, got into this half, we know we were better off going the other way to begin with. If I temporarily promote my 20 degrees to 380 degrees, we can see now that the answer is minus 40 degrees. And if I start at 20 and go back minus 40, I'm in the right place. So this discontinuity here in the middle is not that difficult to deal with. We've just got to remember to do it consistently. And if we have to remember to do things consistently, that's usually a good sign that we can use some functions to help us out. Now, before we get stuck into some code, a little bit of food for thought. It's tempting to go straight away in with class, circular number, and then fill it full of functions. The solution I'm trying to implement, I'm going to avoid creating a new type. I want my types to be regular C++ primitives, doubles, floats, integers, etc, etc. And I want to be able to do things like taking the square root of one of my magic numbers without needing to have special access functions or operator overloads in my class. Therefore, I am not going to do this at all today. No, no, no. Object oriented? Bad. That's fashionable to say at the moment, isn't it? Good, good, good. Lots more subscribers. And instead, I'm going to create a set of template functions which we'll use as and when we need to worry about numbers that wrap. 
Right, here I have a very simple program indeed. I have two integers and I'm adding them together to give me the value in C. I've tagged them as const expression, so that allows me to actually test this sort of thing without needing to compile the code. I experimented with this in the fixed point numbers video and we actually discovered some bugs in Visual Studio through that mechanism. Regardless, it's adequate for today. Now, I've got 90 and 300 and if I add those together I can put my cursor over and I'll zoom in when I edit the video, we can see the result is 390, nothing special there. But if we were working with degrees, I'd want that to wrap around to 30 degrees. So let's solve this with a quick function. Here is my function, circ add. It's going to take in a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and a range of minimum and maximum. I'm going to allow the range to be flexible. We might want negative numbers as part of the range. I've chosen degrees because we can be intuitive about it, but of course the range could be anything, and our function should respect that. My approach to this is going to be to add the numbers normally, and then bring them back into the range. So firstly we should compute the result. Result equals left-hand side plus right-hand side. Now it's tempting to exploit the modulus operator to keep our result within the range, but the modulus operator is quite expensive. It doesn't always work the way you might expect it to, particularly with negative numbers. And if we weren't working with integers, floating point modulus is actually quite an expensive operation. Instead, I'm going to hammer our result until it is within the correct range. So let's calculate that range. If my result was 390 degrees, then I would subtract from that 360, the complete range, to get the result within the range, 30 degrees, like this. Which makes sense until you get to numbers that are considerably out of the range. This will only ever perform the subtraction of 360 degrees once. What if the result was thousands of degrees? Well, I want it to keep subtracting 360 degrees from the result until it's within range. So I'll change that if to a while. What if the result has sent me below the range, I've gone less than zero. Well, in the same way, I'm going to add the range to it. And finally, I'm going to return the result. Now, before you all run off and think, how can he possibly have while loops in a simple addition operator? Keep in mind the reality of using such numbers. Most of the time, you will be within the range. And therefore, if you're adding two of the numbers, the worst case scenario is you are one whole range out of where you need to be. So really, these whiles, effectively decay back to ifs, when the functions are used with expected inputs. Making them while allows them to be safe against unexpected inputs. Let's see if this works. So circ add a and b. If I put my cursor over c, we can now see the result is indeed 30. It's wrapped around to the correct result. Let's just test a few things out. So if I now say b is minus 300, it says the result is 150, which is also correct. I'm happy with the simplicity of this but our function is not very flexible. Right now, everything works with integers. I'd like it to work in the same way the C++ compiler works with any numbers. I want to be able to mix types and get the expected behavior. So let's vomit some template snazziness all over this and make it far more flexible. Firstly, I'm going to tighten up these arguments. Secondly, I don't really know what the return type is going to be, nor do I know what these intermediate types should be either. I'm going to let the compiler figure that out. The left-hand side and right-hand side arguments are currently integer. I want this to be the flexible bit. So let's turn this into a template function. And I'm going to use TL for the type on the left-hand side and TR for the type on the right-hand side. So I can exchange these ints for the types passed in by the template. Why am I doing this? Well, I want to take advantage of the compiler exploiting type promotion. Type promotion is when the compiler looks at an expression to evaluate and works out what's the best type to use for that expression. In this case, a and b are both integers. So the answer should be an integer, and we can see there it is. If I change this b to a d, which is a floating point type, then I've got integer plus float. The compiler will solve that in the floating point domain. So we can see that the type of answer has changed to float. If I force answer to be an integer, and click the compile button, as C++ has become more sophisticated and reliant upon templates, you do start to get some compilation noise warning you that this had to be promoted to float, and I am demoting it back down to integer. There's a risk I'm losing information. And these things become problematic when you're dealing with template functions with nothing but auto and template types, specifically with situations like this. What type should my range min and range max be? 
we can see that range min and range max are actually part of the calculations. They're an important set of values. It might be tempting to take one side of your evaluation. So let's say we use the same type that's going into the left hand side. That's fine. But we may find that that leads to information loss due to the type on the right hand side. I could just fix these to a really wide type and just hope for the best that it's got the requisite precision that I need in order to calculate this accurately. Although hoping for the best is never really the most viable solution when it comes to code, though I'm willing to bet 90% of the world's code is just hoping for the best. This is a tricky predicament because I need to know in advance what this type is before I can use this function. But fortunately, the C++ wizards have come up with a solution through the keyword decal type. Decal type can take the information it already knows and use it to deduce the right type. So here I'm hinting that I'm going to be using the left hand side numerically added to the right hand side. Whatever that result is, that's the type that I wish my range arguments be. And this now works out very nicely. If I put the cursor over my circ add function, I can see that the IntelliSense environment in Visual Studio has interpreted this instance of that function as being an integer left-hand side, an integer right-hand side, integer range parameters, and the result is also an integer. Let's say I change the type of A to float. I put my cursor over C, and we can see that the result is actually a floating point, and it's numerically the correct result too. And IntelliSense this time interpreted the function as a floating point left hand side and an integer right hand side. But the minimum and maximum arguments are also floats. That's the type necessary to resolve this little algorithm without information loss. We could go to town on this with static assertions and concepts, but it's sophisticated enough for my needs. Let's add in a few more functions based on this prototype. To complement addition, I'm going to have subtraction. And all I need to change is this result line. I don't need to change the decal type because the addition and subtraction are the same thing. I'll also add in multiply and divide. The multiply function is one that we do need to take some care with when we're using. If for whatever reason we had 200 degrees multiplied by 100 degrees, we'd be well outside the range of 360 degrees. So this function would spend most of its time sat in this while loop correcting the result. This is why I'm leaving it to the user to decide which is the best approach to do the multiplication given the context that it's needed. When numbers are circular like this, knowing the shortest distance between two numbers is quite useful. And I'm going to lazily evaluate this as being the difference in one direction, the circular distance in the other, and I'm going to return the minimum of the two. The shortest distance function we've just calculated tells me that this distance here is 40 degrees. What it doesn't tell me is whether it's 40 degrees that way or 40 degrees that way. It would be useful to include some sign information to tell us. But this of course now takes us out of our range. We're no longer between 0 and 360. If we'd gone down the route of representing this as an object, that would be quite a difficult thing to represent. But because we've stayed with basic primitives, that's no problem at all to our functions. So let's create a function which will return to the signed shortest distance. If we take the left hand side and circularly subtract the right hand side, we get 40 degrees. If we take the right hand side and circularly subtract the left hand side, we get 320 degrees. We can see that the shortest distance is 40. And to get there, we've had to go backwards from 20. So let's add in a short diff function, which is basically the signed distance between two points the, over the shortest path. Firstly, I'll need to calculate the lengths of the two paths. So here's a right-hand side subtracting left-hand side and left-hand side subtracting right-hand side. And whichever of those paths is the shortest, that's the one I need to return. But if I'm going from left-hand side to right-hand side, I need to invert the result. We can have a look to see if this works. Here I've set A to 20 and B to 340, and the shortest difference is calculated as minus 40. Let's flip those around. So we're going from B to A, the shortest distance, is 40. This time it'll go through the zero in the positive direction to 20. Just to finish this up, I thought it would be fun to create a quick little one loan coder pixel game engine application that uses this new function. And what I want to achieve is a whole bunch of units looking at the mouse cursor. 
Here is the structure for a unit. It has a heading, which will be in radians, but is a periodic number. I'm also going to have a 2D vector for the position. I'm storing all of these units in a vector. In on user create, I create 60 of these units and just scatter them randomly across the screen. And I load up some graphics, very kindly provided by Tutus from the Discord server. Each frame, I raise the background to dark magenta. And if I'm holding the mouse button down, I set the target to the mouse location on the screen. For each one of my units, I calculate the angle to the target using the ATAN2 function from that unit's position. This gives me a value between minus pi and plus pi. So I offset that with plus pi to bring me into 0 and 2 pi. The same as 0 and 360 degrees. Now I'm not going to use my circular numbers to begin with. Traditionally, to get the units to look at the mouse cursor in this way, and to do so in a smooth way, I would get the difference from the unit's current heading to the angle to the new target location, and I would adjust the unit's heading by a small proportion of that difference. So let's take a look. As I hold down the mouse cursor, we can see most of the eyeballs in this case, yes, they are quite delicious, aren't they? do follow the cursor around. But look at this, some of them just spin around. And this is because we have that discontinuity. The math simply doesn't know how to work out that 0 and 2 pi are the same thing. Let us now do exactly the same thing, but using our circular functions. Here I'm calculating the delta using our short diff function. And this time I'm actually supplying the range. It's between 0 and 2 pi. To the unit's heading, I'm adding a small portion of that distance each frame. But I'm also keeping the heading wrapped between 0 and 2 pi. Let's take a look now. As I move the mouse cursor around, we can see that all of the eyes follow gracefully the target. None of them are spinning wildly. We haven't achieved anything particularly miraculous here. And I suppose that's why this is a coding quickie video. It's been more about the templates than the application. But now I have a useful set of functions that will deal specifically with numbers in periodic ranges. I'll throw this up on the GitHub. If you've enjoyed it, give me a big thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. Come and have a chat on the Discord server, and I'll see you next time. Take care.